be found a part of the text. The great Holy Spirit book of the New Testament, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. And I'll begin the reading at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them. And I want you to notice those words. He commanded them. There are consequences to disobeying commands. If this were a military setting and there was a command that was given and there was disobedience to the command, there would be consequences to that. And I want you to know as a body and as the body of Christ that we as believers must obey God. The Bible says he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, mm -hmm. which said he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power. Mm -hmm. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I want you to turn over to the second chapter of Acts, verse 1. I just want you to notice the correlation. The Lord commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. They stayed in Jerusalem because they were expecting something. They didn't know what was about to happen. They didn't know how it was going to happen. But they knew something was about to happen. Did you get what I just said? I don't know what's about to happen. Come on. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I know in my spirit something is about to happen. All right. And God is putting an expectancy in his people that when we come together and pray, when we come together and worship, I believe that I'm preaching to some people this morning that didn't just show up. But you came looking for something. Hallelujah. I don't believe you came looking for me, Sister Olivia. I know we can speak and have a good time, but I don't believe you came looking for me. I hope you came looking for Jesus. I hope you came looking for something from the Lord. And if you will believe it, God is going to do something. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, notice the word, all, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon here is again all of them, each of them. And they were, here it is again, all filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of them began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And I want to minister just a few moments on the subject. I'm expecting a move of God. I am expecting a move of God. Is anybody here expecting a move of God? Hallelujah. I'm tired of being religious. Come on. Come on. I'm tired of talking about God. I'm tired of talking about prayer. Talking about fasting. Talking about reading the word of God. Talking about going to church. Talking about what God can do. Talking about what God did on Pentecost. Talking about what God did in Azusa. And I want to expect a move today. Because if we are correct in what we believe, then we're serving the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if God moved in yesteryear, then I believe God will do the same thing today to a people who are hungry for a move of God. 
Hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to minister and to preach. We thank you for your people, and we thank you for your spirit that has moved in this place thus far. We ask for the anointing once again that you would help us to minister, help us to preach. And Lord, we pray that your anointing will be upon the people as well to hear what I believe you've given us for the service. And we give you the praise and glory and ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I tried to preach concerning the Holy Spirit. I got a little carried away and couldn't really explain a lot and teach a lot. That happens sometimes. Amen, preachers. Amen. But I want, if I can, to explain a couple of things that I feel are important uh, to us as believers and to the body of Christ by way of teaching uh, concerning this passage of Scripture and, of course, others concerning the person and work of the Holy Spirit. You've been coming on Wednesday nights. You, we've been teaching and ministering. But um, this time in the history of the church, of course, Jesus has now died on the cross and uh, he's risen from the dead, which is without that, there would be no church today. And in this particular passage of scripture in the book of Acts chapter 1 written by Luke, this account giving is after the resurrection of Christ. And Jesus here ministering to his disciples, the Bible says, he commanded them to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the promise of the Father. Now, I think as believers, it's important for us to understand and continue to keep in mind that when God speaks, it's vital that we hear it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Uh, if God speaks, or I should say when God speaks, it's my responsibility to hear what he is saying and to respond to what God is saying. And upon responding to what God is saying, I as a believer am going to experience a move of God, the blessings of God, or whatever it is that God has promised me will take place in my life. Now, Jesus did not suggest to them, if you don't mind... Would you stay in Jerusalem? I want you to notice the text. He didn't suggest to them if you get time. <laughs> Somewhere along the day in your busy schedule, he said, I want you to please stay in Jerusalem. No, the Bible says he commanded them. He said, I don't want you to go anywhere. I don't want you to touch anybody. I don't want you to host a meeting or revival. I don't want you to plant a church. I don't want you to do anything until you receive the promise of the Father. First and foremost, they were already in covenant relationship with God. You've got to understand that. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not telling them that they needed salvation. There's a doctrine out there that says a believer has to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues in order to be saved. Well, the Bible in these 66 books in the canon of Scripture does not teach that. Salvation is faith in Christ alone. Stop there. Once you receive, Christ, once you place faith in Christ and what Christ has done at Calvary, then you are saved. There is no, nothing that can be added to that salvation. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't become more saved. You're already saved. Amen. How long have you been saved? Good God from on high. I'm 37. <laughs> 35 years. He's no more saved today than he was 35 years ago. He said, what are you talking about? Because when you got saved, you got to remember something. God gave you something. He imputed to you a perfect righteousness. The righteousness of God, which is by Jesus Christ, him keeping God's law in his 33 and a half years on this earth, going to the cross and dying there, he didn't do that for himself or for the host of heaven. He did that for fallen humanity. And those of us who will simply place childlike faith in that, you and I become the righteousness 
of God. You ought to be happy about that because nothing that ma nothing matters what you were 10 years ago. What matters is that the moment you said yes, you were instantly justified. You were instantly made right. You were instantly declared right. You were instantly in the mind of God declared perfect as a person who has never sinned. Think about that. You're saved. I mean, there's no such thing. I, a brother messaged me this morning and asked me. He said, Brother Torrance, is, will weak Christians go to heaven? I said, yeah. Because God didn't say you had to be somewhere in Christ or somewhere in your walk with God to go to heaven. Mama. I want you to think about that now for just a moment. I'm, I'm not talking about somebody who's not saved, but I'm not, I'm not telling you to be weak, and I'm not telling you to receive all that you can receive from God. But there will be Christians who live miserably on earth yeah. all right. and die and go to heaven. Yeah. You say, I don't believe that. That thief on the cross lived miserably his whole life. And one prayer remembered me. And Jesus said, this day, when you, I know you're a thief. I know you murdered and done everything in your life. But this day, will you be with me in paradise? Why? Because he just simply believed who Jesus Christ is and what he was about to do at the cross. And that's what salvation is. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be deep. But salvation is simple, but we make it technical and we make it hard. And the reason we don't embrace people who are strong, the weak will always be with us. Always. Poor people will always be here. You say, I don't believe it. Why do you think under the Old Testament economy, God told the children of Israel when they would go out and, and, and harvest and gather in the crop, he said, I want you to leave the corners of the fields for the poor people. Yeah. Because poor people will always be here. Yeah. Weak people will always be amongst us. It's just a reality. So before you get high and lift it up and start closing heaven's door, remember you're not the one who opens heaven's door. Somebody's going to go to heaven that you don't like. And you're going to get to heaven and somebody doesn't like you. Come on now, talk to me. So I, I'm, I want to emphasize, and I'm, I'm not in a hurry, so I mean, I'm, I'm just going to explain this and how far I get in the next few minutes, I'm just going to stop. So, but listen to me. Salvation is simple, saints of God. Literally, yes to Jesus Christ. Wherever you are in your life right now, if you're sitting in this place and you're not saved, you don't know Jesus Christ, you're living in sin. I don't care if you've done it for 15 years, if you simply say yes to him today, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you don't have to walk down here. That's a formal thing we do. We ask people to come. At your seat, you can acknowledge it. You don't have to be able to talk to be saved. You can be mute and think it in your heart. That's what true confession is. The problem is a lot of people confess out of our mouth, but there's no fruit. Mama. No matter how loud you are, you can say yes and be the quietest person in church. Yeah. 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 And you'll be right there in heaven. I don't believe you'll be quiet in heaven. Mm. That's just my belief. I think it's going to be kind of loud in heaven. Oh, yeah. The songs that I can only imagine. You think you're going to be quiet when you see Jesus? In those nail-scarred hands? His glory? His power? My God, the Bible says the Lamb, the Son, will be the light of the city. You see those streets of gold? Some of you can't stand the sight of a bowl of cereal without shouting. Now imagine you see Jesus. I saw Zion waving. <laughs> I mean, imagine seeing Jesus, the one you've talked about, the one you've worshipped, the one you've defended. Imagine the day you see. I can only imagine when I see him. I'm going to shout. I'm going to rejoice. It's going to be more than a quiet service that day. I believe at the marriage supper. It's going to be more than a hand waving. Hallelujah. It's going to be some shouting going on there. You got to hear me now. Salvation is simple. 
And so just to to clean that to finish this, I want you to make sure you understand. When I'm talking about salvation, I'm not talking about your prayer life, your fasting, your scripture reading, your cut. I'm not talking about all of that. Those are Christian disciplines. That didn't make you saved. Right, right, right. You're saved because you believe something. Yeah, that's it. And when you believe something, the Bible says by faith, Romans 3.24, you are justified. You are made the righteousness of God because you put your faith in the blood of Jesus. And Romans 5.1 says, therefore being justified by faith, you have peace with God. You're saved. So, yes, we have been preaching on the Holy Spirit. But I want to make sure we understand I'm not emphasizing the Holy Spirit to become more saved. Mm, Maybe I'm belaboring the point, but I want to make sure we do it because people tend to grab one part of a sermon and say, oh, so you saying if I get the Holy Ghost, I'll be more saved. That's not what we're teaching. Right. You can speak in tongues from now to 2029. Every day, 24 hours a day, you still won't be more saved. That's right. Oh, oh. You're saved because you placed faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done at Calvary. You're saved. Think about that. I've lived in sin my whole life, and I said yes. I called on his name. They that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right, right. The thief called on Jesus. You, you know, we look at people and say, there's no way that person can be saved. Sure I want you to go back and read the Old Testament. I want you to find a young man by the name of Ahab. He was a murderer. He introduced Israel to idol worship unlike any other king. And if he wasn't evil enough, he went and married Jezebel and made Israel more wicked. Do you realize there's a place in your Bible where Ahab cried unto God and God forgave him? No way, yes. But it was Ahab's fault that he died lost because he walked away from God. It wasn't God saying, I won't save you, you're too wicked. It was him who walked away. So let me tell you, there's no lost cause when it comes to God. That's why the song said it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows. Up. I don't care how evil or wicked or demonic the person is, there's no lost cause. So salvation is by faith alone. So when Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem, he was not saying the promise is salvation. You got to make sure you're careful in your doctrine. And that, yes, we teach and we have to teach. I don't want to be an excited church and not be a knowledgeable church. Come on. Yeah. I don't want people to walk in here and, and, and stand in the pulpit and finesse people. We just hype a message up and just throw off random catchphrases. I don't believe you guys are going to be shouting because you want to hear the word. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm okay with animation. I'm okay with all of that. I'm very animated. But I want some content in your animation. Don't give me a picture and it has no content. Don't try to get me hyped up by your style and there's no lifestyle. Don't try to get me hyped up by your speech. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's what changes me, not your style. You can take your notes and preach. We take our notes and we go to Bible college and seminary and they teach us at a certain point in our sermon how to hoop and when to hoop and how to tune it up right and how to breathe just right. That's not going to get people saved. Come on, preacher. He said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem because you need power, not because you need salvation. They were already the church. They needed power. And the power would come through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. I'm really trying to hammer this point so we'll understand it. You said, I'm expecting. The reason they were expecting is because God spoke. You think about uh, uh, an expecting mother. All, a lot of you mothers are in here. You got news one day that you were expecting. Yeah. Mm. So when you got the news that you were going to have a child, guess what you started doing? Yeah. Making plans. I, I can't speak on it. Can y'all? <laughs> That's right. Uh, 
I never carried one of them, but I saw them. I don't know the ins and outs. I, I, I just know the headache that... <laughs> Go ahead and keep shouting. I don't know all of the feelings and the emotions and all of that, but I know when the doctor says, ma'am, you're going to have a... I'm sorry. <laughs> ma'am, you're going to have a child. I know that you were expecting something to happen. It didn't happen overnight. Amen. You're right. You had to carry this thing. You were sick. You couldn't stand the smell of certain things. You had headaches. Your body is going through turmoil. You think about the story in Genesis 25. The Bible says that the woman of God asked the Lord, Rebecca, Lord, I want a child. I, I want you to bless me with a child. And God blessed her with two. And then all of a sudden he answered her prayer, but there was a struggle in her womb. And she said, Lord, if you answered the prayer, why am I thus? Because you're about to birth something into the world that's going to change the world. On, now, when you're expecting a child, you're looking forward to the day. You may be hurting at the present moment, but you're looking forward to the day. I'm expecting a move of God. Doors are going to be shut in our face. We're going to fail sometimes. We're going to cry sometimes. But don't let your sin and your struggles and your failure negate what God has already put in you. Something is going to happen. I'm not preaching so you will shout. I just want you to believe the word of God. It's going to birth. But you got to remember Jesus' birth was not by man. It was of the Holy Ghost. So what the Lord does, he will be, it will be done through the Holy Spirit. But it will be conceived by him. And it will be birthed by him. If it's birthed by man, if it's conceived by man, it will fail. Think about the natural birth. Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Yeah. The Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die. I don't care how good you are, what family you come from, how much you take care of yourself. You can eat all the fruit, vegetables. I mean, we try to be healthy as we can. We should do that. We should take because this is the Lord's body. Yeah. That's right. But there's coming a day yeah. that we're going to die. Sure. That's yeah. it. Because the natural birth won't be eternal. So that which is birthed by man is subject to die. But the spiritual birth is eternal. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, you're born in a natural sense, but you have to have a spiritual rebirth. And now your makeup is not just of natural means. You've been regened and you are given literally the genes of God the Father. That's why there's a desire in you to do the will of God. You hate evil. You don't hate people. You hate evil. Well, let me say this. You should hate evil. We should hate sin. And if the believer falls in the sin, it's repulsive to us. Won't we'll make an excuse. It's repulsive because my nature is contrary to that action. So if it's birthed by the Holy Spirit, I promise you, saints, it can't fail. 2,000 years ago. I want you to hear that. Two, th nearly 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit was poured out. It was birthed by God and is still being poured out today because it's from God. Stay in Jerusalem and they started asking them questions. Well, Lord, are you going to restore Israel at that time? Jesus said, don't worry about all of that. Do what I told you to do. Basically, that's what he said. Just stay here. And wait on the promise. He didn't say he was coming in a, a mighty Russian wind, did he? Think about it. He didn't say there will be a visible cloven tongues over each of them. He didn't tell them anything. He just said, wait. Come on, come on. You got to think about it now. When God speaks to you, oftentimes God doesn't give you the details. He doesn't. He doesn't. He tells you what to do. Wait. You go to a mechanic. Now, I'm, I'm the worst 
They said, listen, we're going to put an alternate on your car. I just know they're going to put it on. I don't know the, all the bolts they removed. I don't know what belt they took off and, and what they took put here and put there. I had one guy working on my car, and that's how some saints are. He, he was helping me, and he was a shade tree. Some of y'all don't know what that is, but yeah, yeah. he took some stuff off, and when we got ready to put it back together, he's, he's throwing things. He said, you don't need this. I said, wait a minute, now that came off the car. It should be going back on. Cranked the truck up, blew my motor up. And that's what's happening to us. Yeah. We're listening to men. You don't need this. You don't need the Holy Spirit. You don't need tongues. And then we blow up in the process. You didn't, you're not lost as it regards salvation. But let me ask a question to the body of Christ. Why reject something that the Bible says? You said you're a Christian, so maybe I don't understand tongues. Maybe I don't understand the Holy Spirit. But I want to be careful because if it's in the Bible, I believe it's of God. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration. So the Bible tells us that Israel stepped in a sea and God moved it out of the way. I mean, I don't know if he's going to do it, but I would not sit here and tell you that he can't do it. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm foolish enough to believe God can pick up a building and move it across town if he has to. That's just the kind of God that we serve. You just got to have the kind of faith to believe God. How can a tornado hit and take a baby and throw him several miles and they find the child hanging in a tree? That's not natural for that child to be sitting there breathing and still alive. That's a miracle from God our Father. Somebody ought to give God praise. I don't understand it all, but I refuse to question it. I don't understand how they put the motor in, but I know when I get the vehicle back, it had a new motor. So you're not going to know all of the ins and outs. That's why you walk by faith. Come on, come on. When you walk by faith, I'm going to tell you something. It's one thing to preach this. But I promise you, I am experiencing this and living this more and more every single day. To whom much is given, much is required. You're walking because you said, believe God, believe God. You believe. You got it right. You're saying it now. But will you do it? You get to a hiccup in the road and God told you to go south. And you know what? You're like, man, north looks a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. There's a famine in, in the south. So I'm just going to turn around and go here because it's convenient. But what did God tell you to do? My God. And if he tells you to do it, you got to do it. Yeah. Elijah got to the Jordan River, prayed, God moved the river. Go ahead and walk across, Elijah. All of a sudden, Elisha is standing there and watching, and he prays. He said, what would you have me do? He said, I want a double portion. Why did he ask for it? Because he saw something. Do people see your life and the power of God on your life and they ask for what God has given you? They don't yeah. want you, that but they want that presence yeah. that they see on your life. Oh, you it down. Thank you, Lord. He said, Elijah, I, want, I don't just want that. I want a double portion of that. Yeah. He wasn't being selfish. He wasn't trying to bring glory to himself. He just simply had a desire to want more of God. And God comes in a whirlwind and catches up Elijah. And Elisha is looking and the mantle falls. Elisha picks up the mantle. He walks over to the Jordan and he hits the river and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he called on God, God moved the sea again. And Elisha walked across. That's the kind of God. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's here. He hasn't changed. We can't program him. We can't limit him to this building. We can't put him in a denominational wall. We can't put him on a title. He's everywhere. He is whosoever will. Let him come. Black, white, I don't care. Male, female. That's the kind of God that we serve. Yes, yes, yes. You can't limit him. Mm. Stay here and wait. Stay here and wait. 
And then he told them, he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The command was simple. Hear me just a few more minutes. The command was simple. Usually what God says is simple. Am I right about y'all? Go over there. Don't go here. Don't do this. That's not the voice of a pastor. Come on now. That's the Holy Spirit that will lead you like that. He lusted to envy. He wants every aspect of your life. The part, the little diary too. The little part that's secret, that's sacred. He said, I want that too. I want all of you. You want all of me? Yeah. Isn't it fair? For you to give up yourself? Lord, I want everything you got for me. Okay, well, give me that. That's what we do a lot of times. That's right. That's because right. this is convenient. Saul, kill them all, the Amalekites. Take them out. All right, I'll kill some of them, but I'll keep the, you know, the fat of the calf. I'll keep all of this. And see, what he did was he killed the vow and the refuse. It's so easy for Christians to give up the repulsive things and to look at those things and know that they're wrong. But that little unforgiveness and that sneaky tongue, and come on, talk to me in here. That little mindset that you don't want to let go of, God can't use him. We got into it eight years ago. Well, give me, let me give you a little story about a man who denied Jesus three times on his way to the cross, stood there and cursed and said, I call curses upon my life. God gave him 50 days. And within 50 days, give or take, the same man stood up and said, this same Jesus, who you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And he got up from the grave and he gave an altar call and 3,000 people got saved. You can't deny the access to the Father. You can't deny the access to the glory. You just accept what God is doing and jump in the river when it starts. Come on, come on. <laughs> my, my. God can't use her. God can't use him. Look at her. The immoral life. Look at the perversion. See, we look at the sexual immorality uh, that a person lived in. Oh, he or she had a child. Or they were on drugs. Or they did this. Have you ever read your Bible and realized that those are the ones, uh, the burnt stones that God will use? Uh, you lost your virginity. You lost what you had. You gave up some stuff while you were in the world. But God said, give it to me. I'll wipe the slate clean. In my eyes, you're pure. In my eyes, you're clean, and I'll make you white as snow. Somebody shout if you know what I'm talking about. Praise the name of the Lord. He'll take the drugs. He'll take the alcohol. He'll take it all away because he's God. He's God. Hear me. Hear me just a few more moments. Praise God. Somebody give God a praise. I don't know if he said hallelujah or hope. I'll take it. He said, you shall receive power. I'm not going to finish this, but you shall receive power after. The word power is doing this. I, I, I read this and I can't help it. I shout. You study the word doing this. It's called literally intrinsic power. You look at the lights in this building, they have a source. You know what I'm talking about? Even you check that box back there, you can flip a breaker on and off. Even that breaker box has a source. Yeah. You go outside and you see a weatherhead on the side of the building, those power lines, they have a source yeah. of power. Amen. But the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit has no source. See, Brother DeMond can take some wire cutters and come out here and clip the cable. And there will be no power to this building. Oh, I feel that. But there's no man alive 
who can cut the power source that comes from the throne of God. Well, you failed. You blew it. You don't go to my church. Look how narrow-minded we are. You're not in my denomination. You're not of my race. You're not of my gender. You don't say it just like I say it. You don't sing it just like I sing it. You can't cut the source because it's intrinsic from the throne of heaven. We don't control the power. We are mere recipients of the power. So if it's intrinsic and it has no cutoff valve, it has no shut-off switch. The only shut-off switch is if you walk away. But if the believer says, Lord, fill me, he'll give you more power. If the believer brings empty barrels, he'll fill you over and over and over and over and over again. That's what kind of God. It speaks of miracle-working power. The same power that was on Jesus is in you and I today. Think about it. We get excited by Isaiah chapter 6, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 1 Samuel chapter 8. I mean, we get excited. Oh, the glory of God filled the house. The people couldn't stand. We talk about the manifested Shekinah glory, the smoke. Now, give or take, I mean, you, you believe what you want to believe. I, I'm not going to sit here and condemn it, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm not looking for smoke. I'm not looking for a glory cloud. See, people are looking for manifestations. I want the still small voice. Because see, when you start really understanding the word of God, people at services, oh, we had church today. Oh, I saw dust on the ground. One man said, we saw a feather. I said, what kind of weak angel is that that shed this feather? I don't want an angel like that. That's not the kind of God that I'm not looking for a feather. I'm not looking for gold dust. I'm not looking for a cloud naturally. The cloud is in me because I am the temple of the Lord and his presence resides in you. So what in the world are we doing here? We want chairs to flip. We won't believe God till that trash can flies across the room. You want fruit? Look at me. Drug addict. Drunk. Good God from on high. But saved and full of the Holy Ghost. You want fruit? Look at her. Look at her. Look at her. Look at this one. Look at this one. Look at you want fruit? Look around this room. There's plenty of fruit in this room of what the power of Almighty God can do. The power is in what Christ did. Jesus could have said anything when he rose from the dead. But he said, wait for the Holy Spirit. He could have said anything before he ascended back to the Father. But his last words, he said, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And while they were still looking, the Bible says he ascended into heaven. You know what he did when he got there real there? He took a seat by the right hand of God. Yeah. But you know what else he did? Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they went one place with one accord, same mindset, same desires. Is that us today? My mind. Hear me. Do we have agendas or do we want a move of God? My mind. See, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm learning through studying the scripture, as I, I've been studying the book of Acts, and I noticed in every prayer that's recorded in the Acts, not one time am I seeing the people say, move in this church. Uh -huh. Move upon him or her. Move upon him only. Move upon this one. Just move in Jerusalem. No, because when you look at the book of Acts chapter 10, when Peter went to Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile, in Acts chapter 11, when uh, uh, Peter was giving the account of what happened, the Bible says the people were kind of shocked. They said, you mean to tell me the same spirit that was poured out on the Jews, it poured out on the Gentiles too? you telling me they're speaking in tongues too? They're prophesying too? Yes, because Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. And he also said, the promise is to you, to everyone who is afar off. It's to whosoever the Lord will call. The Holy Spirit, if we will allow him to help us in our prayer lives, 
he will remove selfishness from our prayer. My, my. You know how inconsiderate we are sometimes? Like we all were as children. You know, we are children now. When we were kids, we can't talk about y'all, but we were the same way. Yeah, there you go. Hey, man. Right on it, brother. Right on it. You're trying to lay down and watch TV, and all of a sudden, Daddy, he hit me. Because <laughs> I'm just thinking about what I want. Dad, can you go to the store and get this for me? Mama, I need this. Mama, I need that. Dad, I need this. You see how inconsiderate we can be as people? That's how we go to God. You're right on it, boy. Right on it. Right in the presence of God. Father, I need you to get bless me with the house. I need you to give me a car. I need you. That's why you got to be careful with this prosperity preaching. Because it puts selfishness in your prayer. All you're concerned about is getting rich. When you read the book of Acts at the end of chapter 4, they weren't concerned with getting rich. Those people were persecuted, but nobody had lack. Because everybody came to the apostles and said, here, take this money. They were selling their land and said, give the money to those who are poor. We just want to see people saved. But we've got so consumed with stocks and this and that and that. I'm not saying something's wrong with that, but I'm telling you that the work of God is the most significant thing that should be in the believer's life. If you've got to give two mites, give two mites. Somebody in here may be hungry, and the money you give may feed them and their family for the next few weeks. I'm trying to tell you that all things were coming, and they continued in prayer and the apostles' doctrine. They stayed before God, they gave to the hungry, and they just wanted God's presence. Amen. But the selfishness is here because we're not yielded. We're inconsiderate. Give me. Give me. Give me this. Give me that. You know, this is the most selfish time of the year. You're right. Give me this. Give me that. Give me this. Give me that. I want this. I want that. There's nothing wrong with wanting stuff. So don't. I don't want you to. I'm trying to keep a balance here because we all have desires. We all have wants. Right, right. I got stuff I don't need. Amen. Before you get deep, go ahead and say amen. Amen. I didn't need the last bottle of cologne or watch. I didn't need that. You didn't need the last pair of shoes. You didn't need it. Oh, I preach over here. Did you need it? No. But it sure looked good, didn't it? And guess what? When you die, you're going right to heaven. We spend too much time trying to condemn people for things. I'm not up here to do that nonsense. I'm just telling you as people, we all kind of desire and want things that we don't necessarily need. But when it comes to being a Christian, if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in our prayer lives, you will be broke and hungry, and you'll go before God praying that God feed this man. And while you're praying for him, God will feed you. <laughs> I love that you read the book of Acts. The Bible says the people were there praying for the apostles who had been arrested. And when the middle of them praying, they knocked on the door. While they were praying, God answered the prayer. That's, they weren't praying because they were hungry. They were praying, God, rescue the men of God because the gospel needs to get out. Don't hurt them, saints. Let me say something strong here. Don't hurt the men and women of God who pour into your life. Don't hurt them. Don't put your tongue on them. I'm not talking about this set. Now. I'm talking about any five-fold ministry gift in this church or any building, any, but any in the body of Christ who are sharing the gospel. You ought to loathe them in the sense of respect. And I've never preached on this, but I'll just go here since the Holy Ghost put me here. He said those who deserve, who preach well, who rule well, deserve double honor. He didn't just say the pastor. He said the fivefold man. See, we put the emphasis on the set man, which the Bible doesn't call, but one set man. And he's the chief cornerstone. He's the chief and the apostle. His name is not Torrance Nash. His name is Jesus Christ. Come on. I got to quit. I'm closing, Rachel. That's one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, it's too much here. You got to go back and read Leviticus chapter 23. You study. There were seven feasts in Israel. Seven. Four of them have been fulfilled through the, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
unleavened bread, Passover, first fruits, and now Pentecost. Unleavened bread spoke of the sinless body of Christ. Passover spoke of the death of the cross. First fruit speaks of his resurrection. And Pentecost speaks of the Lord pouring out the spirit on the day of Pentecost, which brings us up to where our text is. Acts chapter 2. That was my introduction. Now, give me a few minutes and we'll close. When you see this, they knew full well what Pentecost was. It was literally... The time of Pentecost, when they were to come to Jerusalem anyway. It was 50 days after the waving of the sheaf offering, Passover, the death of Christ. Now, of course, three of those feast days have yet to be fulfilled, which will come during atonement, of course. The Bible prophecy, which will the rapture of the churches, trumpets, and atonement, the millennial reign of Christ, so on and so forth. But... Four of them have been fulfilled. And you and I as believers can go on to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. With the initial physical evidence of speaking with other tongues, but it doesn't stop there. And I'm going to close with something in just a moment from Ezekiel chapter 47 to show you just a little small picture of what I'm talking about. But he told them on Pentecost... Now, on Unleavened Bread's Feast, you got to go back and study this because there are very intricate details here. But they were to take all of the leaven out of their houses because it spoke of Christ. Passover was to be offered. But on Pentecost, he said, when you come, count those days after, the, after Passover, which would be 50 days. Pentecost simply is a word that means 50. He said, when you count those days and you come to me in Jerusalem, he said, this time with your meat offering, with your flour and the bread that you bake, I want you to bake it with leaven right. instead of without leaven. But there's no sin in Christ, so why would leaven be there? Well, when you read this account in the book of Acts, the leaven was in the people, not Christ. Right. That's why he said leave the leaven in the bread because on Pentecost we would be there. Mm. And whether you like it or not, you and I have what's called a sin nature. Yeah. There's an inner bent in us towards sin. Yeah. But when you got saved, the power of God broke the power of that indwelling sin nature, liberated us from the power thereof, but it's still present. Yeah. Sin is still here. Don't you get it twisted. There you go. Look at yourself. Break it down. That's it. That's it. If sin was no longer a factor and it was gone, you would never age or die. Right. Take your glasses off. Yeah. Take your contacts out. Go ahead and heal your back, your knees, your joints, and get all of that done. Because there's no sin, so there would be no decay, there would be no rot, there would be, come on now, think just a few moments. We think That's sin, we think, oh, I'm not living in sin. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the law of sin and death. The presence of sin is still there. Even though the power has been broken, its presence is still there. That's it. But on Pentecost, the power of the Spirit was poured out because Jesus said, I have to go to the Father and I will send back the Comforter. And that's what he did. He sent back the Comforter to us. That's why the disciples, and not just the 12, but others. Some people say it was 120, but the Bible doesn't say that. Yes, it speaks of that in chapter 1. There could have been many people there. The Bible doesn't give us the specific number that was filled on that day. But they were in the temple court. Acts chapter 2, 46 bears this out. They were in the temple court. They were praying and expecting. Yeah. Think about that. They were praying and expecting. I don't want us to take prayer as a legalism a legalistic rule or some law saying, well, you know what? All they talk about when they preach is prayer. So Monday, I'm going to get up and say, Father, thank you for this day. Don't do that. Okay. We're telling you about prayer because it's necessary. You're not going to please me if you pray. Amen. You're wasting your time if you're trying to do it just to make me happy because I won't know. Mm. I don't need to know. Amen. You go to God in prayer. 
And when you go to him, you should be expecting something because of who you're talking to. Amen. 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 Well, you read on it, bro. Yes. They don't ask us for things because they're not expecting to get it. Right, right, right. I'm asking because I think you got the means to get it. Yeah. And you talked about some shoes and clothes and a, and a Barbie doll and all of this stuff. Man, when you start talking about God, Miracles and signs and wonders and the people in the book of Acts were praying for that. Give us boldness and give us signs and wonders. So they were there and they were expecting something to happen. And then the Bible says, and suddenly Hallelujah. there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It happened the way God wanted it to happen. Because God promised them that he would send the comforter. And they were waiting in Jerusalem for the person of the Holy Spirit to come in a new dimension. And now, as believers, he can take up residence in our hearts. Yeah. But you got to remember, and I don't, I'm not going to get to this. There's a difference between being born of the Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. People say, well, doesn't the Holy Spirit come when you get saved? Yes. He comes when you, nothing can happen without the Holy Spirit. But that's not being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Salvation is for you to go to heaven. Yeah. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you now on earth. Yeah. You need power as a Christian in your daily life for service. We need the gifts of the Spirit to operate and manifest. Yeah. We should welcome it and want it. Yeah. Oh. And as believers, and I'm finished. Musicians, you can please come. And singers. But as believers, I want more of God. I just simply want all that God has for me. Thank you, Lord. Pentecost was the entrance of the Holy Spirit, but he didn't stop there. That was him coming in a new dimension. Here we are in 2017, saints. Are we going to expect God to do what he said. I'm not expecting miracle signs and wonders so people can say, man, you got to go hear that man preach. Okay. Come on, preacher. Hear that woman preach or go see that church. No. That God will be glorified. Yeah. But I do believe this. I do believe we're going to see miracle signs and wonders. Yeah. I believe it. But I also believe we're going to see a harvest of souls. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Like we've never seen before. Yes. Because if you go back to history, there were two rainy seasons in Israel. There was a former rain and there was a latter rain. Yeah. The former rain germinated and prepared the crop. Yeah. But that latter rain matured the crop. I believe that former rain was poured out back then. I believe on, 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 on Azusa Street, I believe God was pouring out his latter rain and bringing the Holy Spirit power back to the church and giving us revelation and knowledge. But man got in the way. Yeah. Sure. They start fighting over doctrine and fighting over everything. Sure, right. Since we can't do it, oh, we've got to keep our eyes on Christ Amen. and ask him for more and more and more. But I believe he's preparing the harvest. Jesus said, look on the fields. They're ready. Yeah. Mm. And it's you and I that's going to gather that harvest. Yeah, that's what Hallelujah. Saying. And whatever you feel led to play, just, just go with it. But that old song is in my mind. I'm not going to put nobody on the spot. <laughs> I'm expecting a move of God. Just begin to play that, please. I'm expecting a move of God. But hear me, in Ezekiel chapter 47, God gave Ezekiel a vision of a millennial temple and the river of God that would flow, no source from any other streams or rivers, but from the tabernacle, the temple, and from the south side of the altar that speaks of the cross would flow that river. There was a man there with a line in his hand. That was a appearance of pre-incarnate of Christ in the vision that Ezekiel saw. And the instructions were clear. Follow the man with the line in his hand. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's what we've got to do today. Follow Hallelujah. Christ. Follow the man with the line in his hand. And he said he measured out 1,000 cubits. And he took him by the hand and said, come on. And he walked into the river. And it was at his ankles. The speaks of salvation. Far too often as believers, we stop at the ankles. God wants to give us more than just being saved. He wants you doing more than just coming to church. Just coming to church, paying your tithe and all of that. A lot of people will be satisfied that as long as we get the money. No, I want to see God moving in your life. Jesus. God doing the work in your life. He measured out a thousand more. He said, keep walking, keep coming. And he went to his knees. Will you keep going? Measured out a thousand more, and the Bible says it went to his loins. And then the Bible says, he showed me, and he looked out onto this river. And it was a, a river that could not be crossed. But it was a river that could be swim in. Yeah. Yeah. You stepped in. You're experiencing God. You're experiencing the move of God. But I'm telling you, saints, I just want to get to the point where I just jump in and swim yeah. in the presence of God. I, I, I just want more. I just want more. I, I just want more of him. I just want more. I can't help it. I just want more. It's burning in your heart. and your, your desire. When you wake up in the morning, there's an expectation because God is birthing something in your heart. He said he looked up and saw this river that flowed to the desert. Desert is dead. But when he looked over into the desert, there were trees growing beside the desert. He said, Because everything that this river touched, it lived. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You who were dead in trespasses and in sins, he quickened you through the Holy Spirit. He brings life to the believer. Looked up again and saw the Dead Sea with the highest salt content in the world. No fish, no life. But the river of God flowed into the Dead Sea and brought life. Fishermen came and there were fish. Every species of fish were in the sea. Because that's what God will do if believers will believe him and trust him. Would you stand to your feet all over the house of God?